Hey guys, hopefully you can hear this. This is my second attempt at uh, doing a video like this. The first time I hit record and talked and talked and nothing recorded. <laughs> so this is my second go at this and uh, I sat here a long time to be honest before I hit go live as it's terrifying. Um, if you've ever done this sort of thing before, it really is uh, there's something about it that's inexplicably um, frightening, I guess, of just sharing who we are. Um, and so I'm going to give this my best shot. Uh, what you see is what you get. And uh, I made a promise to Corey the other day that, that I would share my story, and I decided that now's the time. So here goes. This might take me a while. I've written it down. I've done this before in a, with, with some people in a, in a living room, but um, not, not live on the internet. This is uh, a little terrifying. So bear with me. I'll, I'll give you my best. And uh, hopefully my hope and prayer is that um, this either helps you or in, inspires you, I guess would be the best, the best way to put what I, what I hope comes out of this, that, that it inspires you to, to do your own life at 100%. Um, so I, I, called, I call my story, um, Do You Know My Jesus? In Pursuit of an Authentic Life. And some of this I've written down, some of this I'm just going to share. So if you see me reading, that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, why my story? Why am I sharing? Why am I sitting in front of this camera telling you about myself and not someone else? Why did I end up here? Um, I was born in central Alberta, little town of Linden, moved down to southern Alberta, um, spent a bunch of youth life there, and then moved back to Linden, got married and raising a family, a beautiful wife and four kids, um, love them to death. I own an IT firm. Um, you might say it's pretty average life. Sounds like standard Canadiana, uh, Americana, whatever, um, Western civilization life. Pretty boring, you say. Um, no jail time, no epic world travels, no uh, extreme stories, really. Uh, so why me? Um, and really, this is what I got to put out there, and that is that I have someone I want to tell you about. That's why. Um, first, I've got to share before I get to just the specifics and the speeds and feeds of my story itself, um, I, I've got to share with you um, a little bit about this person that I've spent my life chasing. Um, why is this part of my story? Um, because it's like, um, like Jesus says to, to the religious people who are trying to shut up the believers, he says, if, if they don't speak, even the rocks are going to start crying out. And that's kind of how I feel. Um, as scary and vulnerable as that, that makes me feel, uh, that's the truth. Um, so why is this part of my story? Because a big chunk of my story was about me living my religion. Um, I really was in many ways like Lazarus with, uh, that was raised from the dead, but with the grave clothes still on. I was wrapping myself in the grave clothes of control and self-righteousness. Um, uh, the Christian song by Big Daddy Weave, uh, My Story, if you look it up on YouTube, we also linked it on the Transitions uh, YouTube channel um, under the playlist Inspirational Songs. Uh, but Big Daddy Weave's My Story really is kind of a summary. The lyric is a summary of my heart and prayer. Um, if I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. Um, see, I believe we each we each have this metaphorical shack inside of us. That's that's where this place where we where we put all of our stuff and that we don't want anyone else to see. These are things like my fears, my hurts, my my sin, all my self loathing anger, unforgiveness of myself and others, addictions, hang-ups, and my shame. And then I 
and I build a facade in front of it, and I wallpaper it, and I paint it in order to make myself look as I would like others to see me. And then I guard the front door, because the last thing I would really want is to let anyone else see and, and see what's inside. I'd rather they just looked at the wallpaper. Um, and if I did, I'd tell myself that no one would ever love me. They really knew me. And that's the story of my shack. Uh, what's yours? Uh, a famous American pastor was quoted as saying, let me tell you about my Jesus. Um, when asked about how he became an eloquent speaker and a successful pastor and so on and could speak with such conviction and passion, he answered, he said, he saved me. And to which they replied, yeah, Brother Paul, um, that's nice, but, you know, how did you, you know, tell us how you got to be so eloquent and full of passion? And he says, you, but you don't understand. He saved me. I was a wreck. I was a wretch. I was a drunk lying in the pool of my own vomit, and he saved me. Isn't that enough? And a quote like that strikes me at my core. Um, and it's, it's kind of my story. That's where I keep pointing to. Um, see, it's not about taking a sinner and making him righteous. It's... It's about bringing the dead to life. Um, it's not about making bad people good. Um, really, it is something completely different. This, this gospel stuff, it's, it's crazy. It's inexplicable. Um, but I was dead, and he gave me life. That's my story. Um, so I begin by asking you not only to hear my story, but to, to join me in this kind of lifelong pursuit to take off the mask, to get rid of that facade, to begin to poke holes in it. Um, what I seek is authenticity, really to be unafraid of who I am, what he made me to be. So I ask you, have you ever, have you ever looked in the mirror and felt like a fraud? And said to yourself in that inside voice that no one ever hears, if they only knew? Was it based on something you did, or, or worse, your insecurities? Have you ever hated yourself for who you were? Loathed the person inside that no one else knew? That person who you believed was the real you? The person you would spend every effort to make sure no one else ever saw? Or have you ever believed that you were actually a faulty human being? that there was something actually wrong with you at a fundamental level, that other people weren't faulty like you were. I have. And today I, stand, I sit here, stand here, and can tell you who I really am. A contract that I've personally made with myself to be more of and what I'm put on this earth to do and be. I am a man that Papa is especially fond of. It's a reference um, from the shack, a reference to God, and I believe that's one of the best names for him. Um, that's, how I, that's how I know him. I'm a man who loves myself, sharing insight and unconditional love as much as I'm capable of so that others can change the world to hopefully affect some other people. So how did I go from loathing myself to making a statement like I just did? Well, it's my story. It's, it's really, it's his story. Um, I really want to tell you how God made good on his promise to take a heart of stone and intellectual mumbo-jumbo and replace it with something that cared. It's, it's really not theoretical. Uh, it's what happened to me. How? Why? Well, that, the why is a really good question. I first have to tell you about my Jesus, my God. Um, see, I believe that before the beginning of time, there were these three persons of the, of the triune God, three in one, as oxymoronical as that sounds. Um, 
these three distinct people um, that represent relationship, and they they agreed that they could not bear the thought of spending eternity without you there with them. This is the one true God of the universe that says at every moment you were in your mother's womb, he, he sat transfixed, if you can comprehend that, while you were being formed. He literally could not take his eyes off of you. Um, I believe that's what scripture tells us about our God. Does anyone comprehend that kind of love? Can you own it? Could you put those statements into the first person and say, he sat transfixed while I was being formed? I find that hard to say. Um, why? When I, I guess when I claim that, there's this voice inside that says, but what about that shack with all that blackness? If that came out, I would never be worth it that I actually believe that I'm junk. But you see, you gotta know he doesn't make junk. See, the skit guys say this best in their video, God's Chisel. In it, God's working at chiseling down to the core of this, the, the main character, and he stops God before he gets to the core and says, but just be prepared for what you're gonna find inside. And God's taken aback, and he, and he replies, oh, I, I get it now. You actually think you're junk, don't you? But you have to know that I don't make junk. I'm creating you to be an original masterpiece. And the guy replies and says, but I've let you down so many times. And God's reply finally silences him and says, my son, you were never holding me up. It's I that uphold you with my right hand, righteous right hand. <sighs> Blows me away. Um, can you actually believe that you're an original masterpiece? That if you lived each day believing that you, believing that, what would your life look like? If you just lived, loved. And oh, how he loves us. One of my favorite pieces of poetry is, is this. Could we with ink the oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made? If every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. And could the scroll contain the whole those stretched from sky to sky? So what's the deal then? How do you get in on it? How did I get in on it? <laughs> Ask myself that every day. See, religion says we got to do certain things to curry favor with the Almighty. I, in my opinion, all major religions hold to this basic idea in some way. So how is this any different? I, ultimately, I guess it's called the gospel, the good news. It's what the word literally means. It's like the, it's like the anti-religion. See, he paid the whole debt once, people. Once for all. He's not going back there again. It's done. He's not holding out on you. It's like, in my opinion, it, it's, I, I, like, I look at it like the colossal gamble of the universe. The evil one's game is simple. He just wants us to choose the opposite. God's actions were to provide this absolutely free gift and total peace. And he says, I'll do it up front. It's like this huge gamble because a good question to that is that if it's free, then I can just do whatever I want. And I'm good. See, I think and this is somewhat my opinion, but this is how I read scripture, his proof of true victory over evil is the, is the victory of when we voluntarily choose love over fear, we choose reconciliation and relationship over hate and life over death. There's, see, there's no contractual transaction going on between you and God. If you do this, I'll do that. If you don't do this, I won't do... See, he already finished the job. He made you a son and a daughter of God of the universe by paying on the cross for every piece of evil you could ever dream up. When we choose him, it has no effect on that forgiveness, but it proves that he is greater than evil. See, evil is defeated when we choose love, even when fear is screaming in my face. Because that cho 
to choose that proves it powerless. So the only question remains is whether I'll actually trust that his, his action way back then on that Roman cross was actually enough to cover the debt that I owe. Not only my past, but all, everything in my future as well. And I, it's, it's my trust that he wants. And that may sound preachy, and forgive me if it does, but it's like I can't help but share it. It's what I've come to know about, about the Creator. It's what I've come to believe, and uh, that's my Jesus. I want to spend a little bit of time just giving you some of my, I call it the nuts and bolts of my story. How did I come to be where I am? Um, some of you know me from childhood, some of you never met, some know me only in more recent years. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, I was a loud, outgoing kid. I was super sanguine and wanted to do the right thing. Um, raised in rural central Alberta um, from a strong Holdeman Mennonite family. Um, my mom's family, real salt of the earth people, that's a great thing, that had all the roots in that culture, um, strong supporters of the whole, the whole Holdeman culture. Um, my dad from a family, also Holdeman, um, known for being, uh, what would you say, rebels or questioners. Um, funny thing was that we didn't often view ourselves the same way. Um, and this is maybe an important point because in, throughout my, and I'll speak for myself, only here is I felt I was supporting, I was viewed as a rebel because I was all in and supporting what I viewed as the true way. And, and, and I had this element of wanting to be or needing to be more right or more getting it more correct. I was really committed to the truth. I need to make that point from the beginning because it was often seen as anti-authority or re rebellious. Um, and that's uh, frankly not what was going on in my head most of the time. Um, but it's important that, you know, to see that that was right from early, that was kind of starting to develop a, um, an anti-authority mindset, I guess. Um, for those of you who don't know, hold them in life um, of my friends. In a nutshell, um, we associated almost exclusively, exclusively with other Holdemans, Holdemans being a, a branch of Mennonites, of which there are maybe a hundred plus different flavors of Mennonite. We... We love being more right than each other uh, a lot, I guess. Um, so that's, that was our particular brand. Um, a fairly standard, I would call it a fairly common standard Canadian uh, culture life, other than really restrict, uh, uh, really strict restrictions on media, entertainment, technology, and either, even other branches of Christianity. Going to other churches was, was a no-no. Um, we viewed ourselves as the one true visible church, the, the visible representation of God on earth. Um, and lots and lots of socializing. Men, guys like myself and other men for the most part, um, look pretty common in Canadian culture, but the women had, you know, custom dresses. You can see some of that in the, in the uh, Holdman Transitions video on our, on our Facebook page. Um, and... Uh, so the women had a very, very specific look um, to their dress and the head covering uh, where the men, other than beards, for the most part, were 100% fit into any part of the culture. Um, but just that, that strong emphasis on, on entertainment. And so, um, you know, no musical instruments, um, no TV, radio. Um, but as internet came along, that slowly became a thing, and, and today there's there's plenty of internet and other technologies. It's just mostly focused on the, the entertainment side of things for the most part. Lots of travel all around North America, especially in the youth, um, um, meeting other people, other congregations. There's a strong social bond there because there's so much in, so much in common, uh, but not uh, a lot of people mistake uh, Holman Mennonites or other Mennonites for for Hutterite as a like colony living. No. That definitely not had churches and communities lived in certain areas where where the Holdeman churches were. I called them congregations. Um, uh, that's that in short. Uh, teenage life. We ended up moving to southern Alberta when I was twelve. Um, 
but doing the right thing as I became a teenager really started to involve questioning the status quo, but really, and, and also wanting the approval of others. I mean, I craved it. That's, I learned more about my personality. I, I need external, a lot of what I need is external feedback. Um, and that, at that time, it looked a lot like just simply approval of others. Um, so I started wrestling with that. I had an encounter with um, and accepted and started to follow Jesus when I was uh, 16, um, and I became born again. I did meet him that in, in that. Um, I was at a, a Holman revival, um, in which they have every year. I'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, and uh, some other things. The, uh, through that, I started to really subconsciously start to believe that God was, was a big guy with a stick. Um, and I, I wouldn't have put it consciously, but the part about uh, Holdeman life and their understanding of God really was around it. Um, they believe that the Bible teaches that, that if you do the wrong or right or whatever you want to call them, sins, certain combinations or certain types of sins that you're suddenly uh, separated from God. So they called them death sins. Um, and that meant that you had to start over or re repent before you could regain your salvation. That if you, let's say, died in that state, you would go to hell. Um, and so salvation was by nature fragile. Um, and so by that, it, it, I really learned later that I really started to see him as, as a guy with a stick. I mean, if I did the wrong things, he would cast me into outer darkness and I would come crawling back to him hoping for forgiveness. Now, the beautiful thing about God is that he does. He does continue to forgive, but I, I didn't really understand his true, true nature. So in that, um, with that all being fragile, um, as a youth kid and, uh, you know, wanting to be, a, you know, stretching my, my wings, as it were, um, I did what I think is pretty typical of youth kids. Uh, in that culture, especially, you called it sort of the revival Christian thing, or I called it a roller coaster, because I'd, I'd feel like a total wreck and a total wretch, and then I'd come crawling back to God in these intense set of revivals where everything got exposed, and, and you dug deep and, and, and confessed all, all the stuff you were failing at, and, and then just committed, says, man, this time I'm going to do better. This time I'm going to get it right. I am going to stick with it this time. And because I can't do that again, I'll look like a fool if I'm, you know, struggling with the same stuff again. And so, uh, you know, several weeks later or a month later or maybe a few months. But, you know, in inevitably the, the stuff that we all struggle with when it came back and the struggle was still there and, and failure was still there, um, felt like a total broken wretch of a person and, and gave up again and quit and said, yeah, okay, fine, then I'm, I'm going to hell anyway. I'll just live and kind of get by until next revivals. Maybe I'll be able to solve it then. Maybe I'll get my broken self figured out then. And up and down. Now it looks hideous to me, but that was my reality. That was my truth then. Um, through that, I, I started building some of my core, you know, negative tape that I would tell myself about myself. Um, uh, the guys that I, I hadn't grown up with but got plunked into the group, love them dearly still to this day. Um, but I was the outsider. And so youth kids being youth kids, there was times I was excluded. And I was the geek. And then none of the others were geeks. And back then that wasn't cool like it is today. I mean, the geeks shall rule the, the world and all. I, we're having a better time of it now. So good on my kids, I guess. Because <laughs> they're not far from, from my tree <laughs> Um, but, you know, so to feel like the outside kid and feel like I didn't belong, uh, that was a, that was a big deal for me, the belonging part, um, as it started to grow. I didn't really understand it back then either. Um, and then I had a set of circumstances where I really got to, um, I got to hear the inside stories, stuff that was the dark underbelly of the system of control in the church and so on. And I... Other youth kids generally didn't, I don't think, hear that level of detail, and I did. And it started to give me some cynicism because I saw that the, the, there was a divergence between reality and the claims. And that started to fracture things behind the scenes. Um, but 
the interesting thing is I look back and I see that internal commitment to the truth, really, that pursuit of truth at all costs that kept me pursuing things that I knew to be true and, and within the worldview that I carried. Um, this is, I think, what really started to carry me down a different path than my peers. I, you know, I was committed to it. I started challenging the leadership and that didn't work so well, as you can imagine. But I had lots to learn. That was, those were not some of my finest moments, that's for sure. Um, I moved back to central Alberta, um, found uh, the love of my life, and married her nine months after we met. Uh, she was 18, I was 20. Uh, it's like my dad and my grandpa, so I guess, the, again, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree there, huh? And uh, really poured myself into the dogma and that narrow worldview and that I'm right, I'm right kind of belief and culture. And, and, and I had to go, I had to be right in just about everything. And I, I'm not proud of it, but I was, I was even committed to, you know, telling other Christians that if they didn't believe the way I did, that they could end up uh, going to hell. And I would, you know, I was committed, um, which was a lot of people find odd when, you know, they if they know what were the cliches of what our family is supposedly about, um, that wasn't what I was aiming at, and that wasn't that wasn't the goal. So it was kind of interesting looking back. Um, but really, behind the scenes of that all, there was this growing list of things that didn't fit my worldview. I was having a hard time reconciling stuff with with the Bible and what I was coming to know, things that I couldn't fit in my box, uh, things about God and things about people and stories and the way he was working that I couldn't deny. And But I covered all that insecurity with confidence. Um, I became the closet critic of my culture and upbringing. Um, and that made me two-faced. So I would have a circle of people and... Uh, a circle of friends to chat with and and so on that were confidants and uh, at the time and and would talk about stuff uh, all the stuff that was wrong or not working and all the things that were being done wrong and doctrines that weren't working and so on in the in the church situation and um, on the other side was desperately trying to be accepted and belong and fit in and and, and ultimately that I'm right thing I wanted to fix it I wanted to point stuff out so we could get stuff fixed and be more right and better. Was That was the way to get more right with God, after all, I, I thought. Um, but it, underneath it all, I carried so frightfully much shame over all my failings and why I wasn't feeling what I was pushing. I was good at the discussions where I was in conflict. I, I became really good at hiding my disagreements except to my close friends, and I wouldn't be up front with it, um, except to people I trusted. And this is... This is incredibly much work to protect. Um, it gave me so much stress as it was like triggering that brain fight-flight reflex, the lizard brain stuff, and limbic brain. It was like an overdrive all the time, like juggling lies. It was absolutely exhausting. I never saw it as lies. I was working on two sides of this thing here. But the exhaustion that built over years, um, that was 2000 to 2009, so nine years of brutal um, interview gut ache stuff that, you know, there was lots of inspection times of, you know, Jeremy, how's it going in your life? You need to tell us what's going on and, and stuff. And that was, I was the kind of the first guy to get that call, it seemed like. Um, so in 2009, I'll skip to that. Um, I think leadership sensed that something was up because there were more visits starting again. Uh, it was a late fall. There was literally, I have to say, there was literally pain in my stomach when the phone would ring and I would see, oh, that was from one of the leaders. Uh, they were wanting to set up another visit to talk about, because those visits, frankly, in my world, they always meant bad news. That was always bad news. It was a matter of surviving those visits without gaining, getting condemned for something or feeling condemned for something. I'll just leave. I don't know how much was reality and perception. I'll just leave it there. Um, my dad had some really tough experiences, um, and through that, he had some really powerful visions, um, from God that pointed him in another direction, and, uh, it was something I wasn't, it was new to me, and we had a really good relationship, and, uh, he started, uh, sharing with me, he says, there's this new book I'm reading, he says, you've got to read it, 
Um, probably the best thing my dad ever did for me. Uh, he maybe doesn't realize it um, was introduced me to the shack and through it, it's not the shack in itself. I don't hear me to say this is some sort of Bible. It was a story that God used to reach me. It's a work of fiction. It's somewhat allegorical. If, if you have controversy around it, that is whatever it is. But through it, God began to reach me through the Holy Spirit. And I read the book. And more than that, I listened to William Paul Young, the author's testimony. And the combination of those two things hit me so deeply um, about a similar pattern where he had two lives. And though his led to infidelity and all kinds of stuff, it was still the same pattern that I saw. And I, by then, I, I hated myself so badly for that, that pattern and that two-headedness. I, I was so sick and tired of that that I wanted out, and I didn't know what out looked like. Um, I didn't know what breaking that looked like or that, what the alternative use even was. And I, I heard Paul's story and personal testimony um, that God basically confronted him and offered and says, I'll make your life into one. I'll make you into one person, but it's going to cost you everything. But at the end of the day, there's no, none of this two-facedness. It's one person. What you see is what you get. It might be messy, but you're going to get one person. And when he talked about that, I wanted that so bad. I, I didn't care what it cost. I, it was so vivid to me. I still remember the chair and the place in the house I was sitting in. Um, I just said I was willing to lose everything for it. I wanted that. I was so done. I was done. I was like a man dying in the desert without water. And I saw the oasis. And I got this glimpse of him that says, I will look after it. You don't have to steer the ship or something to that effect. He says, start by opening the door to your shack. It was like specific. It was the clearest voice um, of I, what I knew I had to do. Um, and I did. And in that moment of committing to that, I immediately, instantly, the weight of that pressure was gone. The swirling in my mind. And the ache in my gut was done. I was, I was so done with charting my own path like a chess player. Seeing six moves in advance, I could chart through the, these interviews and they could ask me questions and I could see exactly what they were getting at and I could chart the conversation just in the right way. I was a freaking politician and I absolutely hated myself for it. Um, I was done dancing around with the, the, the right person would hear the right thing from me. I was done with up trying to be worthy of his love. I got this glimpse that it had already been done. It was finished. Once. Done. I'm like, why didn't I get that till now? I was all in. So, I mean, I still sit in that place. If I arrive at the judgment bar... And whatever that looks like, whatever that conversation sounds like, if I arrive there and his blood on the cross is not enough for me, I'm screwed. That's it. I'm, I'm, that's all I got. Um, I wrote a letter to the leadership and explained the other half of me that they apparently didn't know about. I said I had issues with some of the core doctrines in the church, but didn't want to debate them on that because I didn't believe there was any value. I, I believed that the problem wasn't people. The problem was the system. I still to this day love, love my friends, my family, the people still there. Um, it's never been about you if you're listening. It's the system. I believe everyone, every person is a victim, including leadership. Um, I saw them as a, yeah, I, I was, if I can, I felt like if I sat and convinced and went down this path of convincing them of the error, that even if I was successful, the system would quickly have a problem with them and call them out. Um, see, it's, for those who don't know, the leadership structure is not hierarchical. There's a, there's deacons and ministers, and there's a, a rotating group of ministers that help sort out problems, but there's no specific leader or even leadership team in specific. So it's this kind of perfect circular 
protection system. Um, and that's what I see as the problem. Um, so it protects against any change. Um, so after that, there was swift justice. I was, um, they had a members meeting to separate me because I, I confessed stuff in my life or what I was two faced. And, and I knew, I told them, I says, I understand the implications of this stuff that uh, you're going to, you're going to do what you need to do. And, and, and I didn't hold them to that. I knew this, I knew how the system worked. That wasn't the point at that point. That wasn't what this was about, but I just followed it. And I knew that. And so f really for the next two years, I kept waiting for that same voice. I was, I was committed to not, um, not steering the ship again, to, to just listening. And I says, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and I don't know, why was it two whole years of that, kind of wandering in the wilderness, but we were walking with Jesus, and it was phenomenal. Um, but it wasn't about leaving a church. It wasn't about changing a lifestyle utterly and completely. It was just about, hey, i I got to deal with this stuff in my life and become one person. And so we kept going back to the same congregation that I that I was going to, and it's not like being expelled there is, you're not welcome again, they really want you to come back, so you just can't hold positions and stuff, and they, they won't shake your hand, or there's, you know, can't go to members meetings and things like that, can't eat at the same table for the most part, um, though that seems to be changing a lot lately, but that's what being excommunicated really means, um, that they, you know, have this formal declaration, basically, that you're, you're outside the grace of God and going to hell until you would you know, become right with him again, which would essentially mean rejoining their church. Um, but we kept going back there because we didn't know where else. And um, but we also knew of another church, who, which is now our home church, that live streamed online nearby. So we would go with a, we would listen to the sermon at nine a.m. and then go to Sunday school at the Holdeman Church at ten and. As you can imagine, that was some pretty <laughs> serious contrast. <laughs> uh, and we did that for a year. And one thing we knew that that many people on that were walking similar had walked similar roads is that they usually ended up moving out of these kinds of communities or cutting all their relationship ties. And and one thing I glimpsed clearly about the character of God was about relationship building. And he, his his heart was always about building relationships and building them and reconciling them as much as possible. So during this time, I, I did my best, and I think I made some head spin. I, I hope so. I was what I was trying to do is do it different than the cliche. There's lots of cliches that say what people that leave are supposed to be like or do or how their lives are supposed to go, and I was really determined not to follow those cliches and, and say because I wanted my life to show that his, his nature and character was really quite different than I had come to believe. 21, 2011, um, my wife had a lot to do with that next step. She was following me, but again, we were committed. Uh, she was still a member for, for a while, and she can tell her own story how, whenever, however she wants to. Um, but we didn't just cast everything aside. We just says, well, we're, we don't know what he's telling us to do. Uh, but at one point, she says, well, look, let's just go to this other church one Sunday and have lunch with some friends and... You know, we've been listening online, and when we walked in the doors of the building, it was uh, summer, and we, I, I, I maintain that was like just dropping into the pool of water in, in the desert again. Um, we looked at each other after that first service and said, this is where we're coming back. Um, we never went bouncing around between churches. I, I don't know. I don't know what other paths need to look like or should look like. That's not for me to say, but that was ours. And we were home. Um, and for months, every Sunday, we just sat there and wept at the love of God. Um, and I, I, to me, it's still inexplicable. I knew the Bible for the most part. I had been taught stories of Jesus and and the New Testament through my life, but there was something different about just accepting his love and not having a whole bunch of strings attached. Um, so by then, we were starting to get healthier, and uh, I've been since, you know, several years after, a couple of years after that, I was serving on the worship team and helping with music and, 
on stage and, and that's been a huge like the, the community and the love that we felt it's just unbelievable um, so that that part of our life really changed it was that that gap and then you suddenly plugged in and I can't explain really how or why it just happened that way and one other point in my in my journey I need to highlight before I close this thing off um, in 2013 um, I, I was at a place where I really craved the authenticity of Jesus and, and believers that were willing to be raw and real, but I wasn't much good at it myself. Um, whether it was things that I'd picked up from the past or whatever, I, many times I did the opposite of what I wanted to do and I didn't really understand myself. Um, I had a friend of mine invite me to take a, a personal development seminar called Choices and really through that started a lifelong journey of doing life at 100%, just being all in. Um, but one of the biggest things through that is, is I learned to start to love myself. And that used to look like pride to me. And that is, you know, that humility was like, as long as I, you know, thought I was kind of junk, or at least I looked down on myself, um, that was, that was more humility. And I, it, it came home to me when somebody pointed out, one of my coaches pointed out, said, uh, how, what did Jesus say to love your neighbor as? And I thought, and it kind of the bolt from the blue hit me and said, well, as yourself. You can't love someone else until we love ourselves. We're just not supposed to love ourselves more than we ought to. Um, so humility starts to look like the real me. Um, the truth, not less than, not more than, just the reality of whatever I am. That's humility, and that's what I chase. And uh, I give it 100%. That, that was absolutely a foundational part of my journey, was getting some great tools. Like, Jesus tells me to live uh, and love others, and in my journey, choices taught me how. A lot of specifics of how. So I close with this. Do you know my Jesus? He's actually sitting or standing right, right beside you wherever you're watching this from. He invites you to open that door to your shack and, uh, and get real. He promises that if you trust him and him alone, he will make you into one person. He not only knows exactly what's in your shack, but he's already died and paid for all of it. Why are you still hanging on to it? When are you going to let go of those hurts and hang-ups and unforgiveness that we cling to so tightly? See, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I believe that all of us are faced with a decision point or points in our lives where we have to make choices to actually cast aside everything that we have that gives us control and that illusion of control, and actually trust that he did the entire work. We have to confront the stuff in our shack and actually give those things to him, real or imagined. Sometimes allowing him to forgive me is the hardest part. And for me to forgive me, Jesus said he asked a crippled man that was crippled for life if he wanted to be made whole. And that seems like the most insanely obvious question ever, but I ask, is it? The more I think about it, the more I realize it's a really, it's it's a real question. Being healed means having to let go of victimhood. My name is Jeremy Regeer, and I believe that love is the most powerful force in the universe. I believe that the opposite of love is fear, not hate. And I believe that our greatest fear is worthlessness. I believe that we conquer our fear by confronting it with authenticity, usually through vulnerability. And I believe that authenticity is truth which we love pretty much above all. Thanks for watching and hearing my story. I hope it inspires you in some way. It's my prayer that God would touch you the way he did me. Bye.